Okay, well, wait, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I'll make a start. Um, I'm Terence Gore, and I'm from the Department of Medicine in um, University. And uh, this is uh, called uh, A Short History of the Brain. Now, it's actually uh, one of two lectures I'm going to do, uh, this one and next month. Uh, the next one is going to be on uh, the history of nerves, uh, particularly with regard to a fellow who was professor of physiology here in the 1940s, uh, Sir John Eccles, who did a lot of work on that and uh, won the Nobel Prize, incidentally, but uh, that's for the future. But let's uh, concentrate on the brain uh, now, and I'm going to really start from point zero up to the present uh, with a fairly heavy influence uh, on the, the previous uh, part of history. Well, uh, humans like to think that uh, the, the, the human brain is the only uh, seat of consciousness and free will and self-reflection uh, in the universe. Uh, maybe that's true, maybe it's not. Do we differ so much from earthworms in that regard? Is, is a, an earthworm conscious of its uh, existence? Uh, who knows? Certainly the human brain is a very complex organism and these figures are the kind of things that you see in the boy's own annual you know, 100 billion nerve cells and uh, 150,000 kilometers of nerve fibers. I've no idea where they got these figures from. But certainly the very large number, a mind-boggling number of joints between nerves called the synapses, that's absolutely for sure. But where did it all begin? Well, I'm going to start with the Greeks, and because um, that's one of my favorite topics, I have to say. And uh, I'm going to talk about the pneuma which is the breath of life, and what I'm leading up to is a consideration of what is the soul, what is consciousness in terms of the mind. Well, the Greeks and many early people, of course, recognized that the breath was important to life, and that once breath stopped, well, then life stopped. And so there was something very uh, important about life, and of course, we read in the Bible that uh, man was formed from dust and then God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and he became a living soul. And so the breath of life, the pneuma, into the human soul apparently came from God. Now there are a whole lot of Greek words, that, uh, Greek and Latin words, so I'm just going to briefly go over, but they all basically refer to blowing, wind, spirit, animus, all of those things. So the first one is the word pneuma in Greek, which means breath uh, or spirit. Uh, they're kind of interchangeable in Greek. And the Holy Spirit in the Bible, if you read the, the Bible in Greek, is uh, pneuma hagion. Uh, and so in Latin, that is transformed into spiritus, and that comes from the Latin word spiro, I blow. So you can see the connection there. Psuche, or psyche, means, psuchein in Greek means to breathe, Animos is the Greek word for wind, so you have animus, animal, animation, all of those things referring to life. And then the artery is the air carrier in Greek, aertario, the air carrier, which comes from the idea that the arteries contain pneuma, spirit, air. We'll see how that uh, evolves a wee bit later. Well, where does all this reside? Uh, uh, Bassanio in Merchant of Venice says, you know, tell me where is fancy bread or in the heart or in the head. Well, Hippocrates, who was an early uh, Greek writer, uh, said it was certainly in the brain. Uh, but an important philosopher and an early scientist uh, that uh, you really admire once you read his work is Aristotle. And he says that it's in the region of the heart, not in the heart. Actually, if you read the original Greek, uh, he says it's peri-tecardia, like around the heart, or in the region of the heart, not strictly in the heart. The significance of that will become a bit obvious a bit later. Well, where did all these ideas come from? Well, I'm going to start off with the, the Egyptians. Uh, <clears throat> a great deal of early Greek medicine came from the Egyptians. Uh, they, of course, developed it enormously themselves, the Greek, but uh, the Egyptians certainly thought that the soul, whatever the soul is, resided in the heart. There was no doubt about that. When they mummify the body, they completely discarded the brain. They removed the brain through the nostrils with metallic hooks and just discarded it. They didn't even bother to mummify it. But the heart was mummified with great care. And uh, we see lots of uh, representations of the heart. Uh, here's a papyrus of a scribe called Hunifer. Uh, 
uh, and his uh, mummified heart here is being balanced against the feather of truth. And uh, the judgment is being made by the jackal-headed god Anubis here, uh, and the result is being recorded by the uh, scribe of the gods, who is Toth. Uh, and if uh, his heart balances the feather of truth, he makes it to the afterlife. And if he doesn't, well then, Amit, the uh, dragon uh, with a crocodile head and a, a lion body and a hippopotamus uh, rear end, will devour him. The Iliad of Homer, now that was written uh, down in about 7 or 800 BC. And uh, do come in, do come in, um, around that time. And the uh, Iliad is a great font of Greek medicine. If you uh, look at it, there are a, a large number of wounds that are really well described, so you get a good idea about Greek idea of anatomy and medicine, and certainly trauma medicine. Now, the brain is never referred to specifically in uh, the Iliad or in other Homer's works, but uh, certainly the soul is the, the, the spirit of a person, if you will. And there are three parts uh, that are described in the Iliad. The psyche, or the psuche, uh, and when Hector is killed by this fellow here, who is Achilles, uh, we read that his psuche fled from his limbs and went to Hades. Uh, the other two elements that are part of the early Greek soul is thumos. Now those of you that uh, know some anatomy will know this is kind of related to the word thymus, which is up in the neck, if you will, or in the upper part of the chest. But the thumos is mentioned a lot in the Iliad. And it is in the diaphragm, or close to the diaphragm, and it's an exhalation of vapour from uh, hot blood, angry blood that has been stirred up uh, into animation. So it's to do with emotion and, 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 and anger. Uh, and then the final one is nous, or noos in, in Greek, and that is knowledge. Uh, but again, that is related to the diaphragm, and it is yet another word that's used, and that is frame in the Iliad. Now, uh, frame means approximately mind or understanding, but in anatomy, you'll remember, the phrenic nerve is the one that supplies the diaphragm. So all of these things are described as being around the heart, if you will, or around the diaphragm. Now, Plato, uh, in his Timaeus, describes the soul as a tripartite element, and he describes it like a charioteer, uh, who is really the controlling element, controlling two wild, um, barely controllable horses, one being the uh, base instincts, sex and appetite, which is the black one, and then the uh, emotions, the anger and fury, which is the white one. So that's the way he conceptualizes it. But Plato's pupil, who was Aristotle, had a completely different idea. He said that the heart or the mind or the psuche, soul, I'm going to use all these words interchangeably, is related to the heart or around the heart. Now where did he get that weird idea from? Well, in the uh, book, when he describes this, called De Anima, he gives uh, a number of reasons that you may or may not think are valid. Uh, the first is that he did a lot of embryological research, and he noted that the heart and the blood vessels are the first organs that are formed in the chick. So it's not unreasonable to suppose that the heart is the mind, suke, brain. The heart also is warm in the uh, human body, in, in the animal body. In fact, the heart was co conceived as a, a, a furnace that provided the animal heat, which was an important element in life. But on the other hand, when the brain was touched uh, with an injured warrior, uh, it was cool, it was cold. Uh, now, he rationalized that the heat from the heart rises, therefore the brain is a cooler, if you will. This is the way he describes it. And the human brain is larger than the animal brain because uh, the human animal is hotter than other animals. <laughs> uh, of course, uh, life stops once the heart stops beating. Uh, that's important because in Aristotle, the soul is mortal. The soul dies, finish, when, um, when, uh, when the person dies. Also, the emotions are felt in the heart. And then he thinks about worms and sea urchins. He did a lot of research 
in uh, the Greek islands on um, uh, fish and uh, uh, other sea animals, and he noted that they were sensitive, and yet they appeared to have no brain. And of course, we're all aware of you know the burning heart of Jesus, uh, expressing love, uh, and so. Uh, most of the philosophy of the Catholic Church until very recently is, is pure Aristotle, I have to say. But the uh, idea of the brain being the centre of uh, the head being the centre of, of uh, cognition uh, was gaining traction and the first um, dissection of the brain we know about is by this man called Alcmaion of Croton. Now Croton was a Greek colony on the toe of Italy. The Greeks uh, um, you know, populated uh, quite a number of areas around the Mediterranean, and this was one of them. And Croton was a medical school. Uh, and one of the uh, originators of that school of medicine and other things was Pythagoras, he of the theorem. Uh, and another uh, graduate of that uh, college was uh, Empedocles, who originated the uh, idea of earth, air, fire and water, the four elements. So Alcmaion graduated from that medical school, it was quite famous, and he uh, described dissecting the optic nerve. And here is the optic nerve which you try to trace back to the optic chiasm in the brain. Uh, and he also wrote that physicians should draw conclusions from empirical observations. Now many of the texts that uh, we're relying on here, apart from Aristotle, uh, have been lost, but they're all described by a man I'm going to talk about later called Galen, who's a very important uh, uh, person. So that's Alcmaion. Now, <clears throat> after um, uh, Alexander uh, the Great uh, conquered uh, most of the known world uh, and then suddenly died, his empire was split into three. And uh, one of uh, three of his generals uh, got um, kingship of each of those areas. And the most lucrative and desirable of all was Egypt. Uh, and the general who got Egypt was Ptolemy. Ptolemy I with his son, Ptolemy II. And he decided to, sit to um, transform Egypt, uh, and particularly the capital city that he <coughs> built, Alexandria, into a center of excellence and he developed there what really was like a university if you will. Uh, there was a massive library, the largest library in the known world uh, and he collected manuscripts from everywhere he could. Uh, then he set about attracting scholars uh, and uh, people of wisdom from anywhere in the world. He uh, provided free board and lodging and substantial stipends for them uh, and so this library of Alexandra, Alexandria developed into really what was like a university. And one of the people that he attracted the, uh, was this man called Herophilus. Uh, he came from Chalcedon, which is up near um, Istanbul. Anyway, uh, he was interested in human dissection. And the other thing that Ptolemy allowed, which was forbidden to other Greeks, was to dissect human bodies. So Herophilus... Uh, had a large number of uh, bodies to dissect. Later writers said that he actually operated on live criminals also. Uh, that is uh, speculative. But in any case, he was most interested in the nervous system and he demonstrated that all nerves originate uh, or are attached to the spinal cord and the brain. He dis distinguished nerves from blood vessels, they weren't very obvious, nerves from tendons and sensory and motor nerves. Incidentally, the word neuron that we, we use today uh, in Greek means just a cord, that's all it means. Uh, so a bowstring was a neuron, and so a neuron could really attend it or any, any sort of rope-like structure. So this was quite a major advance. He also thought about the pneuma that we've been mentioning, and he located the receptacle of the pneuma uh, in the ventricles of the brain. And so he developed this pump-like theory that the pneuma was in the ventricles and was pumped down the spinal cord and along the nerves. He also described uh, quite a number of anatomical structures that we know today, the, the meninges, the covering. He described a thing called the calamus scriptorius, uh, which means uh, the, um, the scribe's pen, which is a, a structure in the, in the floor of the fourth ventricle uh, here, uh, and a thing called the torcula of Herophilus. 
Now, torcula in Greek means, uh, means a, a wine vat, sometimes translated as a wine press. It's not a wine press, it's a vat where you keep the wine. But it's the confluence of various sinuses, the superior, inferior, sagittal sinus, straight sinus. So they all meet in this, uh, this wine vat at the back here, which is called the uh, torcula of Herophilus. So he's an important uh, individual. Now his student also in Alexandria uh, worked with Herophilus doing these bisections and he was most concerned with uh, uh, nerve function particularly and he developed the idea of the sequence of spirits, natural spirits being formed in the liver which are related to um, base instincts, hunger, sex um, and the, the basic drives if you will, the natural spirits which are then uh, carried in the blood, uh, carried in the arteries, I should say, they're like in air, if you will, uh, to the lungs, where they are transformed into vital spirits, which are near the heart, and therefore they're associated with mm, anger and vigor and all those things that make a person vital. And so he, uh, it was, that uh, described the arteries as being air carriers, air terio, terio mean carry in Greek. Now, why was there no blood in the arteries when he dissected them? That's the question. Well, the reason probably is that uh, in order to make the dissection better, he starved the animals that he was using. He used baboons as well as humans. Uh, and also, once he had killed them, he most probably cut their throat. So we won't dwell on all that nasty stuff. They probably exsanguinated, uh, and so the arteries uh, had no blood in them. Uh, he then described the animal spirits, which were in the brain. Here's just a little sideline. Uh, Erasistrosus, before he came to Alexandria, worked as a doctor uh, to quite a number of um, potentates around the Eastern Mediterranean. And one of them he worked for was a fellow called Seleucus, who was the uh, tetrarch of uh, Syria. Uh, and uh, he was called to attend to the son of Seleucus. Here's Seleucus here. Uh, and here is the son called Antiochus. And he was inexplicably sick. Now, why was he sick? Well, Erasistratus uh, took the young man's pulse and he noticed that when the um, uh, Stratonike, who is this lady here, who was the wife of the king, Sir Lucas, came into the room, the young man's heart started to go boom, to de boom, to de boom uh, when he took the pulse. And so he diagnosed this was the reason why he was sick. It was love sickness. And uh, the same story goes, uh, Sir Lucas uh, very generously gave his wife to his son. So, anyway. Well, all this uh, stuff that I've been describing, uh, <coughs> the original texts have been lost, and we know almost all of it from Galen. Now, Galen was uh, certainly the most well-known of all the Greek doctors. He worked uh, in... Um, Pergamon in the eastern coast of Turkey uh, uh, as a doctor to a gladiatorial school and learned his surgical and anatomical skills there, then moved to Rome where he was the uh, doctor to at least four emperors uh, and uh, researched and lectured and wrote uh, and promoted himself shamelessly. Uh, but uh, he wrote a vast amount of material. And the book that we're most interested in here is on anatomical procedures, and there's a copy of it in our library, uh, and where he described his work on the brain. And he just did a lot of dissection uh, work on the brain, described the cra all the cranial nerves, or at least 10 cranial nerves, I have to say, not, not 12. Uh, he distinguished sensory and motor nerves, and he uh, said in his book that the sensory nerves are softer than the motor nerves. And the reason for that, it's not true, but uh, he said the reason is that they are for impressions, you see, uh, so they're softer than the motor nerves. He described the autonomic nervous system uh, as well, uh, and particularly he uh, said that the animal spirits, again, were uh, stored in the ventricles and seep into the brain and then down the spinal column. Uh, his system of physiology is, is outlined here so, like uh, these other previous people that I've talked about, uh, the natural spirits are formed in the liver, they are transferred uh, to the heart, where they're infused with vital spirits, which come from the lungs, and then part of uh, that 
vital spirit containing uh, air or blood or mixture goes to the brain to be transformed into vital spirits which then are distributed to the peripheries. Complicated system. Well, now we really have a gap of almost a thousand years or perhaps 1200 years from Galen <clears throat> to the Renaissance. And there was almost no research done in the brain uh, during that period. Call it the Dark Ages, if you will. Uh, but the one theory that pervaded the whole of that period until about the 13th century was the cell theory of the brain. Now, the idea that the uh, brain has got ventricles uh, came from Herophilus that I've talked about before. Well, <clears throat> Original research really stopped throughout the world and the church, the developing uh, church, uh, took over the right to say what people should believe about everything, including science. And uh, the church fathers, who were the people that wrote the original versions of the New Testament, um, also pontificated about the brain. And the earliest book we've got is from this man called Nemesius, who was a bishop of Emesa, which is now Homs in Syria. And he wrote this book here called On the Nature of Man. It was kind of a mixture of Galen, which I've described before, and Christianity, sort of uh, purified Galen, if you will. And so this is a drawing from 1300s, maybe 1200 years later, uh, describing, illustrating the text of on the nature of man. So there's a thousand years between here and here. Uh, and this drawing is quite well known. And you can see that there are various uh, ventricles, I think. So there are five ventricles uh, here that are described. And I've, I've transferred some of the words here. Census communis is this one here, <clears throat> which the people in the Middle Ages considered to be common sense, if you will, census communis, where all the um, sensory information came in. So essentially information from the eyes is coming in here and also to this other ventricle next to it called imaginatio. And then there's another one here, estimativa, another one here called cogitativa, and then at the back, vis memoria. And incidentally between the two, between the vis memoria here and this one here, cogitativa, there is a worm-like structure with an eye. Now those of you that have done some neuroanatomy will know that I'm mentioning the vermis. Now well, the vermis, I won't wander off into a description of the vermis, but it's really interesting the way it's been uh, handled uh, in, in anatomy all through uh, history. It means worm, and it's kind of a worm-like structure that is seen between the two cerebellar ventricles when you pull them apart, but we won't go into that uh, so much. Well, now we're really skipping to the Middle Ages and Leonardo da Vinci. And Leonardo da Vinci was not only a great artist, but he was also uh, um, a really good scientist, a very good anatomist, a very good anatomist, I have to say. And uh, he did a lot of dissection work, but of course he didn't have access to human bodies, and so he uh, dissected um, animals, uh, oxen particularly, ox was his favourite. So he looked at the, uh, the ventricles, uh, and he decided, how am I going to uh, investigate them? Well, so what he did was he took an ox brain and drilled a hole into the ventricles, one of the ventricles of the ox brain, put a straw down, put another straw into the bottom of the ventricle, drained all the CSF out, and put molten wax down the top straw and let the set wax set. And then after the wax had set, he pulled all the soft tissue away from the ox brain, and that's what he got. Well, that's as good as he could get. So... He was a very imaginative fellow, and so he drew it onto a human, and that's how he got that picture. Uh, he also described the uh, cranial nerves, you can go through them. They're not quite right, but, you know, he had no medical tra or scientific training, but he did pretty well, really. Now, the other thing that Leonardo was interested in is, where is the soul? Okay, well, if you're excited for first principles, it's probably reasonable to suppose that the soul is in the middle somewhere. Okay, fair enough. So he is thinking here, where is the soul? So he's taken a box of the outer edges, not really of the brain, but including the face, and where is the middle? Well, that is the middle right there. 
But then he said, well, you know, a more likely place is probably the pituitary fossa, which is that, but it's not in the middle, unfortunately. So he's thinking, and he did several drawings like that, just to try and figure out where the soul is. And we know that that's what he was doing, because he wrote some notebooks, uh, and so these are still in existence, and you could read them. So I decided to repeat his experiment with a CT scan. And so what I've done here is to try and uh, reproduce what he's got here. And I've got the lines there. And I've got the sole right here, just <laughs> at the top of the pond. Uh, but I don't think that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, Leonardo was uh, a guy that I admire a lot. And then with the magic of um, PowerPoint, you can see that uh, Leonardo uh, was ambidextrous and, and just for fun, for no apparent reason, he used to often write with his left hand and he'd write instead of just for fun, right, left to right, he'd write right to left with his left hand, you see, that's just for fun. I see probably showing off, I'd imagine. And um, so that's what he's done here. But with um, PowerPoint, what we can do is flip it the other way around. And now you can see he's written up Imprensiva Senso Communis Memoria. And then he's labelled the cranial nerves here. So, you know, he was quite a, a, quite a thinker. Now, we're going to skip now to the 16th century, 16th century and the early 17th century, namely the 1600s. Well, the um, Renaissance period of Leonardo was not a time of great scientific endeavour. But the early 17th uh, century certainly was. There was an explosion of scientific endeavour, and it was all based originally on the idea of scepticism, the idea of questioning everything, question everything, start off from the beginning, wipe the slate clean. And one of the per first people to do that was René Descartes, and he said, okay, I'm going to start off by not believing anything at all, and start off absolutely from scratch. And his idea was that the human body is a machine. He wrote some philosophical works, but he described his views on the body in this thing called Tractatus de Homine. Uh, and so the body is just a machine completely uh, unrelated physically to the soul. And the human works purely on reflexes, uh, you know, a sensory reflex and a motor reflex coming down the same nerve. Now here is his view of the brain. Now I have to say he didn't have any training did no dissection. This is all just a philosopher's view of the brain. Uh, so all the pneuma is in the ventricle. Now, which ventricle is it? Well, he's only got one, so you know he doesn't really appreciate that there are several of them. Uh, he considered all the nerves to act like strings, like bell pulls in you know upstairs, downstairs. You pull the bell, pull the rope, and the bell rings up the top. That was his idea of the nerves. And in the wall of that ventricle, there were a whole of little holes. And these holes would be opened by the strings being pulled, and the pneuma would then go down the, vent, down the nerves to stimulate things. That was his view. Now, where does the soul come in? OK, well, the soul uh, controls the uh, <clears throat> pineal gland. Uh, is the soul in the pineal? Maybe. It certainly controls the pineal. And so the pineal is able to be moved or swung by the soul to open and shut these little portals that allow the pneuma to go out. Unfortunately, uh, the um, pineal is outside the third ventricle, uh, which is a bit of a problem for him, uh, although he didn't realise it, but he's placed it inside the, uh, the ventricle. Uh, later authors, uh, in fact, uh, Steno of Stenson's duct, uh, pointed out that animals have a much bigger pineal than uh, humans, which is a bit of a problem if you're going to call that so. Anyway, this idea of separating the body and the soul is called dualism. So you'll hear people talking about Cartesian dualism. And what they mean is that the mind and the body are completely distinct entities. They don't relate to each other, and the body's a machine, as opposed to monism, where the mind and the body are all just basically one substance. Well, now, in this 17th century, there was an explosion, as I said, of intellectual activity, and there was great competition between Oxford and Cambridge. Cambridge had Newton and uh, Co. Oxford had this guy, uh, <coughs> Thomas Willis, but also Robert Boyle, the chemist, uh, Robert Hooke, 
the experimentalist, uh, Christopher Wren, uh, and a number of other luminaries who were the originators of the Royal Society. Now, this book is, uh, we have two versions of it in our library here. Uh, it's written by this man called Thomas Willis. He was uh, a physician trained in Oxford. He was a physician to Charles I, um, and he wrote this book called Cerebri Anatome, Kuya Kessel, which means, which uh, has added to it a description of the nerves and their uses. Now, we've got an original 1664 in the um, uh, main library and the Hocken collection across the street uh, and we also got a beautiful uh, facsimile edition which uh, uh, the people in um, the library Christy Ballard and uh, Richard German have uh, put down onto a dis nice display on the wall in the, in the university library, in the medical library, go and have a look. Uh, so one of the nice things about it was that the illustrations for this book are all done by Christopher Wren. Now, Christopher Wren was one of these polymaths um, who could do anything, really. He was <laughs> professor of mathematics uh, at what was the first part of the University of London. Uh, he was an architect, and he designed St. Paul's, and on and on and on. He just, you know, brilliant at everything, really. But he drew the, all the illustrations uh, for this book. Uh, so now we're going to just um, have a look here. Uh, he's most famous, I suppose, contemporarily for describing what is now called the Circle of Willis. So it's an arterial uh, circle around the base of the brain. And he described the anatomy of it by dis dissecting it. And he then uh, injected various parts of it with ink and followed where the ink ended up in the brain. And so he mapped out the vascular supply of the brain uh, and he then occluded, uh, pinched off, various parts of the circle of Willis and could demonstrate collateral circulation and so on. It's a very nice work, it really was. Now, uh, he is what's called a, a yatrochemist. Um, in the history of medicine, people talk about uh, yatromechanists, people like Descartes who thought that the body was just a machine, just a, a mechanism, as opposed to yatrochemists who thought that medicine was all to do with chemistry, with, with chemical movements. So Willis believed uh, that there were not just basic elements, earth, air, fire, and water, but there were spirits, sulfur, salt, water, and earth. And uh, he was a believer in fermentation as the fundamental uh, method of physiological action. Fermentation in the blood, in the periphery, causing fever. Fermentation in the muscles, causing many explosions, causing the muscles to expand and contract. You can read all about this. It's quite an interesting theory. Uh, he described two types of nerve fluid, a, a kind of a nerve juice that irrigates the entire uh, nervous system, the spinal cord and the nerves. But in floating down, this uh, nerve juice are animal spirits uh, which go to the muscles to produce these explosions. Now, the interesting thing, for me at least, is that he describes them as subtle corpuscles. Now, those of you that have read Boyle, Robert Boyle, um, uh, will know that uh, he was the first person to use this term, the corpuscle, uh, meaning a molecule. So Boyle, much of Boyle's chemical work uh, refers to the structure of uh, substances, and he introduced this idea of uh, the corpuscle, which really is a molecule. So, and they were great friends, of course, and they, they dissected together. Willis, uh, Boyle, Wren, another guy called Lauer, uh, and so on. He described various white matter tracts. He said the white matter is more fibrous uh, than the grey matter, and therefore it's, uh, therefore it's for uh, passage of the spirits. Uh, he described uh, a thing called the corpus striatum in the mid part of the brain. Very nice description here in uh, cerebral anatomy, and the corona radiata radiating white fibres, which he called the King's Highway. And, uh, and he introduced a number of words that we still use, the anterior commissure, corpus striatum, the inferior olive, stria terminalis, lobe, peduncle pyramid. He described, the, the, he introduced the term vagus, the wanderer, vagus nerve, and he described the solar plexus, where the vagus nerve spreads out into the abdomen. He also introduced the term neurology, so when you talk about neurology, uh, Willis is the person who introduced the term. Well, uh, we're going to switch from England uh, to Italy.
Marcello, Marcello Malpighi is important in this story because um, he did two things. After Harvey described the circulation of the blood, Harvey was unable to uh, decide how the arterial and the venous blood joined up because he didn't have a microscope. Uh, but Malpighi solved the problem using the tail of fish. And he looked at fish tails, um, living fish tails, under the microscope, little tiny fish, and could see these capillary connections uh, and arteri uh, capillary connections between arteries and veins. So that's why he's most well known. But he also wrote a book called De Cerebro in 1665, looking at the anatomy of the brain. And uh, he described um, under the microscope, he was one of the first to use the microscope, uh, what he called glands in the, in the grey matter. Uh, this is a, a drawing from De Cerebro, which is also in our library, uh, and it's not quite clear what he was looking at. He may well have been looking at red blood cells, to be frank, but he at least uh, looked at the uh, microscopic anatomy of the, the brain. The other book that he wrote was on embryology, and he was the first to describe the notochord and the closure of the notochord. Uh, and that is also in De Cerebro. Well, we're going to skip a little bit uh, from the uh, late uh, 1600s to the early 1800s, and we're going to just look very briefly at the 1700s, the 18th century, if you will, because that was dominated by a philosophy called vitalism that you may read about in, in various books. Now, vitalism uh, said essentially that there is some kind of substance, pneuma, spiritus, that sort of pervades the whole body and provides dynamism and life. That was the idea of vitalism as a philosophy. Um, well, based on this, uh, people became very interested in hysteria uh, and also hypochondria and dyspepsia, whatever that means. Uh, hysteria with a bewildering kind of range of physical and mental ailments and the hub of vitalistic research was Edinburgh in the early 1700s, a place where the Munros came from. But the first to talk about it was this man called Robert White. Uh, this is Robert White here. And there's a book in our library also here by uh, Richard French uh, called Robert White and Selden Medicine. Uh, and he believed that there was a sentient principle which is a vitalistic principle that pervaded the whole body. And he arrived at this idea because he took a decapitated frog and after 15 minutes after the thing had died, it was still, he was still able to pinch, its, um, uh, pinch the animal and get a, a, a response. So he said that there was some nerve principle that was everywhere in the body. Um, the next individual is this one, George Chain, who wrote a book called The English Melody. The English Melody basically is nerves if you will, whatever that is. Uh, shattered nerves, shall we say, and I won't say any more than that. He was enormously fat, <laughs> um, and he acknowledged this, and so the book he wrote was to do with uh, depression and obesity, and he made some money, really, by offering cures for obesity uh, through his books. And the other one is William Cullen, who was Professor of Medicine in, in Edinburgh, and he talked about nervous energy with another book that's in our library, uh, Synopsis Mosologia. Um, the photocard, but I won't spend too much time on those. But getting back to reality, so we just, just to speak, I need to mention uh, Giovanni uh, Morgagni, and some of you may have heard of the Morgagni hernia. Well, he was an excellent anatomist and pathologist. He was uh, trained in Bologna, uh, and one of his teachers was Antonio Valsalva. Uh, in 1715, he became professor of anatomy in Padua, and previous professors had been Vesalius and Fallopio. So uh, he wrote this book called De Cedibus et Causis Morborum, Per Anatome and Dracatus. So it's uh, of the uh, site and causes of uh, diseases. That's basically what it says in Latin. And this was uh, a compendium of 700 case studies that he looked at in great detail and then followed it up with dissection at the end. Uh, and really it's a wonderful book because he describes cerebral palsy, inflammation, hydrocephalus, stroke, hemiplegia, he hemorrhage. They're all described. And his importance really is that he described disease as coming from an organ. Uh, 
So disease is, you know, he, 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 the cry of suffering organs. He also <coughs> importantly noted that injuries on one side of the brain resulted in paralysis or weakness of the opposite side of the brain. Now that's an important concept that's going to come up a wee bit later as well. Need to mention phrenology. Uh, so this was uh, became all the rage of the early 1800s. Franz Gall was a German uh, qualified in medicine, and his assistant was Johann Spurzheim. So the two names, Gall and Spurzheim, are together. Well, he uh, chose neurology and psychiatry as a specialty in Vienna, and he had access to a very large number of patients to work on. And he decided basically that there were areas of the cortex of the human brain that, were, that controlled emotions and various aspects of personality. That was his fundamental idea. But more importantly, the uh, well-developed areas of love and hate and anger produced a bump on the head. That was, uh, and the bumps could be felt by feeling the person's head. That was the fundamental idea. Uh, so he believed, uh, he got this idea originally, so he said, because he saw a boy at school who had a prodigious memory for uh, remembering texts and books, and he had big pop eyes. So he therefore uh, uh, rationalized that there was something pushing his eyes forward, and it must have been the, the faculty of memory. Anyway. Oh, he also described uh, how one of his psychiatric patients swooned, a lady, no less, uh, swooned in his arms. And as she was falling backwards, he happened to feel the back of her head, which was very lumpy. And so he said, oh, aha, uh -huh. the lumpiness and, and swelling at the back of the head is a, uh, a sign of, how can I put it delicately, um, you know, uh, lust. Uh, I think. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me move on. Uh, anyway, so... Um, it, this met with great opposition with, from the church and authorities because it basically would say that uh, criminals are not really responsible for their actions. It's all to do with whether you know, they have a well-developed area of honesty or dishonesty or whatever over the brain. And he wrote a book about this. Uh, he and his assistant uh, were the, the butt of jokes of various sorts. Uh, he was uh, supposed to have been given the skull of Descartes, the philosopher, and he decided that Descartes had a very small anterior cranium, so therefore he wasn't, wasn't very bright at all. Uh, and then the philosopher Majondi uh, gave Spurzheim, the assistant, the brain of Laplace. Now, Laplace was one of the most brilliant mathematicians uh, that the world has ever seen. Uh, and he gave the skull to, um, to, uh, to Spurzheim to analyse but unknown to Spurzheim, he had quickly switched the skull to the skull of an imbecile. And so Spurzheim said, oh, you know, this most wonderful man, this man is brilliant, and, and so on. Anyway, uh, so he was the butt of joke. But they did actually make some positive neurological uh, findings. So they uh, hardened the brain with alcohol uh, and uh, uh, opened the cerebral hemisphere as it teased out various uh, fiber bundles. And they noticed that there were certain fibers that connected the cortex and passed through the medulla and they decussated, meaning that they crossed over to the other side. And you'll remember that this was uh, an idea that Morgagni had already uh, postulated. And uh, so in the white matter, they identified two types of fibers. Uh, and the main difference uh, types of fibers that they described were these. Uh, fibers which go from the medulla up into the cortex, which are called projection fibers, they call them projection fibers, then some that go across this connection bridge called the corpus callosum, and they are called commissural fibers, and then other fibers that go from one area to another, called association fibers. They were actually describing the reticular activating system, uh, but they did some uh, positive anatomical work. But of course, uh, they were the butt of jokes, uh, and uh, there are many, many comic, you know, caricatures, I should say, uh, in the press of um, self-opinionated people uh, describing, you know, how you could choose a wife or a husband just by feeling the bumps on their head and making a decision about whether they were good wife or husband material. And there were a proliferation of lecturers, 
uh, offering uh, lectures and, and free uh, bump feelings and, and all that kind of thing. So it was really big business. Um, I should say that Matt Gardner gave me uh, a loan of this thing, which is one of his prized possessions, I think. And uh, this comes from uh, one of the Fowlers. It's called Ellen Fowler on the front. And the Fowlers in America in 1836 uh, hit on uh, phrenology as potential big business. It was a real um, money spinner. So the Fowlers um, turned it into an industry. They cranked out these porcelain heads. Uh, they developed uh, uh, lecture programs and um, sort of revival meetings where you know you, you listen to a lecture and then head to head bumps felt and you paid your fee and all kind of thing. It was really big business. Let's get on to the more scientific uh, kind of things. Uh, the, first, uh, the first half of the 1800s was really to do with French uh, investigators and in the second half German investigators. So we're in the first half really where a man called Pierre Florens uh, analysed the cortex of pigeons uh, not quite clear why he used pigeons, because they're very small, obviously, but I suppose they were easily managed. Uh, and he decided that if you did make small uh, damage areas to the um, cortex of a pigeon, there was no particular abnormality. But if you removed the entire cerebral hemisphere, the, per the, the pigeon didn't die, but it abolished all perception and movement and judgment. It was just completely apathetic, just sat there. Uh, it wouldn't eat, wouldn't do anything. But on the other hand, if he threw the, the, the pigeon into the air, it would fly. Uh, but on the other hand, if he destroyed the cerebellum, then uh, there was no equilibrium or coordination. And of course, if he described, destroyed the brain stem, then the animal died, the pigeon died. But he, from this, he said that really there, there was no specific area of the brain that causes um, uh, individual movement or sensation, as uh, Gall and Spurzheim had said. But this was uh, overturned by a man called Paul Broca. Uh, he was, um, again, a French physician, who worked in many Paris hospitals, uh, and he was the originator of this uh, speech area uh, of the brain uh, in the left posterior frontal region called Broca's speech area, which is the area uh, <clears throat> which controls the mechanical movement of the tongue and the formation of speech, not the intellectual formation, but the mechanical formation. And um, he arrived at this because one of his patients was Mr. Le Bourn, who was nicknamed Tan because Tan was the only word that he could um, vocalise. And Mr. Tan eventually had a stroke, he died, and Broca was able to do a post-mortem dissection, and he found that he had a large infarct of just this area uh, of the posterior frontal lobe. Uh, and so uh, Broca did the same experiment on various other patients that he had and identified that as the speech area. He was interested in many other things. He described Cro-Magnon Man, who was an anthropologist as well, really, described the venous spread of cancer, the nutritional cause of rickets, used the microscope for early tumour formation. He wrote a book on aneurysms as well. So he was really a very broad and very well-respected um, neurologist in, in, in French medicine. But that's Broca's area. Now the next area we're going to come to is called Wernicke's area, which is also associated with speech. Now Wernicke was a German. Uh, he worked in Vienna. And uh, he postulated that in addition to a mechanical control area of the brain, there must also be an intellectual control brain, a uh, control area, an area that controls the intellectual side of understanding uh, words or read, understanding what you read and then turning it into intelligent speech. And he discovered another area here between the auditory area in the upper part of the temporal lobe and the primary visual cortex halfway between called the posterior superior temporal gyrus and he identified this as the area that controls speech and reading and listening understanding. Uh, so people that have damage to this area have effortless but unintelligible, uh, it's fluent speech but it's, it's all jumbled up, whereas patients that have damage to Broca's area are unable to actually vocalise to make uh, the sounds come out. He also described thiamine deficiency, uh, which is also related to a thing called Wernicke's encephalopathy, 
Well, now, <coughs> the next uh, development in, 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 in neurology really is the mapping of the cortex. And we now go really to, to London and the uh, National Hospital for Nervous Diseases, which is called Queen Square, uh, the centre of London. And Sir David Ferrier, uh, <coughs> Hewlings Jackson, and a couple of other luminaries I'll be talking about were important there as well. Now, uh, a couple of Germans, Hitzig and Fritsch, uh, had, uh, dissect or had experimented with dogs uh, and tried to uh, stimulate various areas of a dog's brain to demonstrate which areas controlled which part of the brain. Uh, but they were really basically unsuccessful because they didn't use enough stimulation. But David Ferrier, a physician at the um, uh, Queen Square used monkeys uh, and he used uh, more stronger um, continuous high current to stimulate areas of the brain and he basically mapped out areas of the brain that when stimulated produced various movements of various parts of the body and he worked with Hewlings Jackson that I'll talk about in just a moment. Uh, he described 15 different areas Incidentally, in 1881, he was the first um, person to be prosecuted with the Cruelty to Animals Act, which had come into force in 1876, and it was a very important political uh, thing at the time. Now, his colleague at the Queen Square was a man called Hewlings Jackson, who was interested in two things, stroke and epilepsy. Uh, and by evaluating patients who had stroke in the right or the left cerebral hemisphere, uh, he worked out that, or he considered at least, that the left cerebral hemisphere is associated with speech and movement, uh, whereas the right cerebral hemisphere is associated with the emotional uh, aspect of speech, artistic creativity, if you will, perception and sensation. He had an evolutionary idea of the development of the brain uh, that the, through evolution, there were simple reflexes beginning at the spinal cord level, uh, gradually moving up to the frontal cortex, but basically uh, human brain activity was a higher form of reflex activity. Uh, and the other uh, area of interest was in, in um, epilepsy. And so he identified um, some things that are still talked about today, uh, Jacksonian epilepsy, epilepsy referring to one cerebral hemisphere. Uh, grand mal, seizure was another term that he, he demonstrated. But importantly, he demonstrated what he called the Jacksonian march. The idea that when an epileptic uh, episode occurred, it appeared to go progressively uh, and predictably through various body parts, like may start with a finger, then a hand, then the wrist, then the arm. Uh, but not the other way around. And similarly, uh, he could predict the way an, a, a, uh, an epileptic seizure marched across the brain. Uh, so this suggested that there was some kind of uh, topography of the brain that was mimicked on the cortex. Well, uh, another uh, London person going back a bit earlier was uh, James Parkinson. And this is a book that you might like to read. It's in Dunedin Public Hospital, Public Library, The Enlightened Mr. Parkinson. And it's a really, really good read. It's just a, a book that was published uh, two or three years ago. James Parkinson was a physician. He was actually an apothecary surgeon. And he uh, wrote a paper describing uh, what he called paralysis agitans, shaking palsy, patients who have got uh, a sort of blank face um, and a stooped, appearance and a tremor, a particularly an attention tremor. And he uh, spent his life working toward it. Uh, his, <clears throat> one of his interesting uh, aspects is that he was a very good geologist uh, and he was particularly interested in geology and paleontology and he wrote uh, quite a number of books on that. Um, I'm speeding up because I'm running out of time. I need to talk about Jean Martin, Marc, uh, Charcot. Uh, in his, today he was called the Napoleon of the Salpetriere because he looked like Napoleon. He was a little, short, aggressive, dumpy man like Napoleon. Uh, and he worked uh, throughout his life pretty much in the Salpetriere Hospital. Now the Salpetriere has got a very famous history. It was built in 1603 as a, uh, an ammunition uh, dump by uh, Louis XIV. And um, 
so it was, that's how it got its name, Salpetriere, saltpeter from making gunpowder. Anyway, by but the early 1700s, it had been transformed into a vast, absolutely vast asylum. Something like 8,000 people there. Uh, there were people with genuine neurological disorders, but others who were um, just uh, poor people, really. Uh, anyway, it was sort of a dumping ground. Uh, and then Philip Pinel in 1795 famously unchained the uh, mad people in the Salpetria. That was his, his famous thing. The other thing about Salpetria is that that was the hospital that uh, Princess Di was taken to after um, you know, the crash in the underground tunnel under the Seine, and she was taken to the Salpetria. So it's uh, still on the left bank, it's still a working hospital. Well, Charcot was uh, really the main uh, urologist and physician in the Salpetriere for almost 40 years or so. And he uh, <clears throat> uh, had a vast number of patients to work on and he analysed all of their signs and symptoms uh, and documented them. He developed a laboratory where he could e evaluate post-mortem material and it was a, he developed it into a great neurological learning centre. This is a quite a well-known painting of uh, Charcot, uh, showing his star um, hysteric person, Blanche Marie Whitman. I'll talk about her in a moment. Here are some other famous names. One of his assistants, Joseph Babinski, Gilles de la Tourette, Parano, Bourneville, Pierre Marie, Jean Lamite, uh, and all these other people's names are known. Uh, he was particularly interested in multiple sclerosis, and he um, uh, dissected and post mortem people that had. Um, uh, multiple sclerosis uh, and compared multiple sclerosis to Parkinson's disease and he was so intrigued by Parkinson's disease that he dug out the original paper of Parkinson and he called it La Maladie de Parkinson, that's the way he always called it, so he attributed Parkinson's disease to Parkinson which is kind of a nice thing to do. He also uh, described motor neuron disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, uh, but particularly hysteria. So uh, you can read all about uh, uh, Charco, he's a very interesting character, that's for sure. We get to the second half of the, uh, the uh, 1800s and now the focus goes to Germany and Alwart's uh, Alzheimer was a neurologist again in Vienna uh, and he looked at patients who had, had degenerative conditions and in some of them, when he post-mortem uh, the brain and analysed the brain, noticed that there were tangled fibrils in the uh, brain and also what looked like starch granules. Now starch in Greek is amylos uh, and so he called them amyloid, uh, starch-like. Oid tacked onto a Greek word means like something, so starch-like, amyloid. So he thought it was like starch, in fact it's protein. Anyway, these were the patches that he identified, so he did that. Now, just a mention about surgery, and I am running out of time, I'm sorry about this. Um, uh, surgery, really, neurosurgery began in Edinburgh, in Glasgow, I should say, with this man, William McEwen, uh, in the Glasgow Royal Infirmary, where the first brain operation was done on this young girl, Barbara Watson, uh, who had seizures on one uh, side of her face and one arm, and so, uh, because of the previous dissection work that these people had done, uh, McEwen identified a tumour that must be on the right side of the brain and operated successfully. Um, now, the neurosurgery was possible for two reasons. First of all, the introduction of anaesthesia and also the introduction of antisepsis with carbolic. And of course, Lister uh, had worked also and made his discoveries at the Royal Glasgow Infirmary as well. In London, there was Victor Horsley, uh, who was the surgeon at the National Hospital in Queen Square first to remove a tumour of the spinal cord, uh, and also he developed what's called the Horsley-Clark stereo apparatus in 1908, where he could identify lesions within the centre of the brain using stereotactic direction, that's Victor Horsley. The final surgeon I just need to mention is this Canadian or an American originally, he went to Oxford, he worked with Charles Sherrington on a Rhodes Scholarship, then went back to Montreal, set up the Montreal Neurological Institute, uh, and was particularly interested in epilepsy. And he it is that did the definitive mapping of the cerebral cortex. And these drawings that we see here that are in every medical textbook 
uh, come from uh, Wilder Penfield. Well, Phineas Gage was a um, railway worker uh, in 1848 in the American Railway. Uh, well, the railway was expanding. Uh, his job was to, um, to uh, drill holes into the, the, the soil uh, and put blasting powder down and, and blast out rocks and so on. So he did this with one of his um, holes that he bored. He damped down the uh, powder and was distracted in some way. And for some reason, the, the tamping rod exploded and then went up through the base of his skull here, like this, and it came out the top of his head. Uh, well, one thing led to another, and um, he actually recovered. Uh, but after that, when it had gone through his frontal lobe, he became childlike and unemployable, really. And uh, it was a very sad story. Uh, very soon after that, he um, became disinhibited and childlike, and he was dismissed. But the idea of frontal lobotomy uh, really took off when uh, it was found that uh, monkeys uh, could be made less aggressive and they could be made passive by doing uh, cutting off the frontal lobes or damaging the frontal lobes. And the first person who did this was Edgar Moniz. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize, incidentally, for it. He developed a technique of going up through the top of the eye to uh, chip out the frontal lobe. But there, not everything uh, went well with lobotomy because, unfortunately, there was a man called Henry Mollison uh, in 1953 underwent uh, he was very severe epileptic and underwear, underwent bilateral removal of the hippocampus, the medial part of the temporal lobe, bilaterally, and immediately he lost all memory, completely. Uh, he had no forward memory, something that happened two or three minutes ago he couldn't remember. So it was a very sad story and he was just permanently <coughs> disabled because of that. Well, I'm going to just... Uh, flick on just for a couple of slides here because I've run out of time. Computer technology, of course, has uh, made enormous leaps and we won't go into that. Uh, the next thing on the block may be artificial intelligence. Uh, is it possible maybe to uh, plug into the internet, plug our brain into the internet? Maybe that's something for the future. I've done a uh, sort of an overview of the history, uh, but we still haven't decided where is the soul. Uh, <laughs> Well, this is a book that's quite worth reading from the philosopher Daniel Dennett. And he believes, even as a philosopher, that the brain is basically a multi-layered uh, computer program working on the template of, uh, of, of the brain substance. And he thinks that uh, consciousness is explained by a computer. Um, but various people, uh, including John Eccles, that I've mentioned, and I'm going to talk about next month, uh, professor of physiology here in Dunedin, uh, believe that's not the case, that there is in fact some other es uh, um, entity called the, the soul, if you will, uh, that controls the brain, and that is a dualist uh, view, and he's not alone in that view. But maybe, really, we're still looking, kind of like Leonardo da Vinci, uh, and we haven't got the answer yet. Thanks for your attention. I'm sorry we don't have time. Do leave if you have to. Uh, any questions? Yes. Um, when is this all going on in Greece and Rome? What's happening in India and China? In China. Look, I have to butt out of that. I don't know almost anything about Chinese medicine. I apologise. Does anyone? I, I, I'm sorry. Uh, it would be interesting to look at that. Um, I, I don't know is the answer. Any other questions? Right. Thank you for Thank coming. You. <laughs>